All right, good morning, everybody. Hope you're well this morning and uh, welcome to our fa the first of our series of roundtable conversations under the AmCham Business as a Force for Good initiative. Um, my name is Max Olokelo. I'm the Chief Executive of uh, the American Chamber of uh, Kenya. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before we begin, just a quick rundown of uh, our, run of sh our run of show. Um, <clears throat> following my brief introductory remarks, um, we will have an opportunity to listen to our keynote speaker, Victor Ndiege, CEO of Kenya Climate Ventures, who will share his insight on the innovative work that they do to drive commercially viable climate smart enterprises and financing value chains on waste management and so on. Following that, we will turn the spotlight on three of our longstanding members, Coca-Cola, the Wilder Foundation and Dow Chemicals, to share their insights um, on what their companies and organizations are doing to champion positive climate, environment, biodiversity, and resilience programs. Thereafter, we will have a panel discussion and a Q&A that will be moderated by Rebecca uh, of Hudson and Sandal. Um, and at that time, we will um, ask members to submit their questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, so that we have a conversation. Um, Rebecca will be um, fielding your questions, much as she will be moderating the discussion as well. We request you to keep your audio uh, muted and your videos off at all times, unless you're called upon to speak. So ladies and gentlemen, Kenya ranks 152 out of 181 countries on the World Bank Index for climate resilience, which if you ask me is actually quite low and something that we need to, to focus on. Droughts alone cost Kenya about 8% of the GDP every five years. And these are increasing in frequency. Under the, a green economy scenario, the Kenyan economy would outpace business as usual by 12% by the year 2030. So you can see there's a huge opportunity in going green, as they say. Now, why is this specifically important for business? Two thirds of global consumers told the Carbon Trust that they want to understand the impact of supply chains and support carbon labeling. The Bank of America predicts $1 trillion in investments are set to flow into environmental, social and governance, or ESG as it's referred to, funds every year for the next 20 years. Last year, investors with assets over $4.5 trillion demanded companies to improve their human rights due diligence in their supply chains. G7 finance ministers are set to make reporting in line with the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures mandatory for companies and banks. So clearly this is a big deal. And over and above this, enforcing our collective ability to adapt to climate risks will ensure that we remain and maintain a conducive physical environment for doing business. It is for this reason that we have developed the Amcham Food Force for Good initiative, an initiative that seeks to champion and amplify sustainability and social impact initiatives by our members, promoting collaboration in support of green growth and our communities for a resilient Kenya. Today's session is part of a series where we will facilitate discussions on sustainable business practices. We want to share best practice, practical experiences, challenges, and even opportunities with the aim of advancing sustainability as a core business practice. We welcome you to join us in this initiative and to share with us what you're doing to embed sustainability at the heart of your businesses. So with all that being said, um, I want to kick this off. I'll introduce our keynote speaker. Victor Ndiege is the chief executive at the Kenya Climate Ventures Limited. Victor has 14 years experience in investment program design, development and management, fundraising, fund management, business modeling and assessment, public private partnership frameworks and investment linkages. Prior to joining the Kenya Climate Ventures, Victor worked at Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund and KPMG. 
including um, doing international development at, at, or providing international development advisory services, providing technical expertise, leading investment and portfolio management, enterprise development and impact monitoring and reporting of renewable energy businesses and climate smart technologies in East, West and Southern Africa. Victor has a Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture from the Egerton University and a Master's of Business Administration and Strategic Management from Nairobi University. He's a member of a group that's called Clean Tech Group 50 and uh, 50 to watch and, and, and uh, you know, sits on that panel. So Victor, um, Karibu Sana, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope I'm audible enough, Maxwell. Yes, you are. Please proceed. Thank you very much for that uh, elaborate uh, introduction. And uh, I think it's, um, it's important for the fact that uh, we are um, converging today basically to talk about what has been done and what can possibly be done to achieve uh, sustainable uh, entrepreneurship, sustainable business in the context of uh, uh, you know, climate change, uh, adaptation and, uh, and resilience. So I will start by introducing the organization that I work for and, uh, and what we do. Uh, I work for Kenya Climate Ventures. So we have been in the market for about five years now. Our focus has been mainly, you know, financing climate smart solutions and uh, supporting climate smart enterprises here in Kenya. Uh, we have been uh, investing in several sectors, uh, commercial forestry, agribusiness, renewable energy, water and, uh, uh, and waste management, which uh, of course is driving a lot of discussion around circular economy and how we, how we, how we manage waste. Uh, over the years, we have invested in um, 20 enterprises in the country uh, across board, uh, having invested around 400 million uh, Kenya shillings. Uh, so that comes with a lot of experience in uh, what um, enterprises can possibly do and uh, how enterprises can possibly collaborate to be able to create resilient markets, participate in those markets and, uh, and, and drive uh, transformation within uh, within communities. So uh, I will start with where I see, uh, where I see the opportunity most. So uh, it's, it's very critical that the drive for climate action is, um, is taking real shape now. And um, in, uh, in ex with my experience working across, across, across the continent and also across the globe, it is turning out to be a very important aspect that um, green technology, uh, resilient markets and um, clean technologies are uh, adopted by various enterprises. Uh, while um, we know that um, it is a contribution that we make to the overall sustenance of the planet, uh, it is important that most enterprises seek to embed this in their businesses or participate in value chains that um, promote uh, clean technology, uh, promote climate smart solutions. And, and we have no shortage of such in Kenya and we have no shortage of such in, um, in, um, in, in the globe. So most talked about and uh, probably one of the most, um, you know, invested areas in, in green technology and, uh, and, and, um, and, and response to climate change is uh, possibly the renewable energy space. And uh, what I would want to focus on is how this possibly with the experience we have had as um, uh, infiltrated into the businesses that uh, are, are already adopting it and what opportunities of, uh, are there. So I want to take an example of, um, you know, the, the off-grid power supply for, uh, uh, for commercial and, uh, and industrial use. So in the, in the recent past, we have um, had in the media and we have also had several conversations about, you know, reliability of mainstream supply of, uh, of power and uh, also the cost, the cost of it. And uh, one of the aspects that uh, are coming out very clear is uh, to what extent businesses are actually losing productive hours that would uh, contribute to uh, to their revenues. And um, in one of the key aspects is that uh, 
most uh, businesses now are looking for you know energy efficient solutions that are supporting to access stable power and uh, while we note that uh, it is um, it requires a lot of resources at the onset of it initial capital outlay is very huge it is also important to look at it from the context of what do businesses lose by not looking at you know green sustainable and more efficient power supply so for example in a, uh, in kenya businesses experience uh, up to four power outages in a month i mean this is just an average of what smes experience and this could be totaling to around uh, maybe 24 hours of lost productivity and, and this results into about four a loss of four around 5.4 percent of of their sales if you if you look at it from that point of view uh, then it means that uh, over the years there are accumulated losses that are experienced as a result of unreliable inefficient uh, power supply and what do the businesses do so some of the businesses have chosen to you know uh, have um, you know backup uh, generators power generators and, and some of these are actually about 66% of them are driven by diesel. So from the context of clean energy and climate smart solutions, there is still you know, lack of it, even though there is a response to be able to stabilize power supply. So uh, what, what I say is that there is a, a, a large market for off-grid solar, for example, for CNI, uh, commercial and, um, and industrial use. And this provides a lot of clean energy and um, more reliable power. So uh, the beauty of it is that in Kenya, you know, there are local engineering firms that can be able to support businesses to adopt this kind of technology and drive it for their uh, for for their uh, for their for, for their use. And uh, if if you take an example, for instance, you'd see in the recent past, companies like Offgen Limited have been able to work along with, uh, uh, you know, Glaxo, uh, Smithline, for instance, to be able to put up a 108 million solar power plant that is going to support them to have reliable power and eventually, in the long run, reduced on their cost of doing. Of, of, of doing business you know we have had previously about total kenya solarizing their service uh, stations we have had in the agri sector you know uh, companies like williamson steel solarizing their factories uh, in western kenya and other parts of kenya so this is basically to achieve uh, not any much but um, 70 to uh, almost 100 percent reliability on clean power and of course in effect reduces emissions of uh, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and those are some of the climate smart technologies that you know if you go out there in the market you'd interact with i had mentioned earlier what it really means to put this on stage and it's very expensive so one of the things is that you know organizations like uh, kenya climate venture uh, amongst others energy access venture and some of the local banks have already adopted you know, um, very, very, very tailored products that can support enterprises to adopt this kind of technology. So that is an area where you see a lot of opportunities and it will be growing um, um, in the near future and in the long term, considering that energy transition and the clean green transition will, will take a while to, uh, to, 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 to actually um, continue driving as long as we are involved in, uh, in manufacturing and, uh, and commercial activities. Another area which uh, I see a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of opportunities is to, uh, you know, over the years, uh, many of our businesses have relied on, um, uh, many of our businesses have relied on, um, um uh, fuel wood for uh, for uh, powering you know most of the boilers and uh, and 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 their you know local energy consumption and one of the facts is that uh, you know replacing fuel wood with alternative biomass is uh, is possible and uh, that is bringing a lot of attention to sustainably produced briquettes also in the context of waste management and uh, and circular economy so, so you, you find it, for instance, you know, the demand for fuel wood is estimated at around 19 million, uh, you know, cubic meters per, per year. The production is very low at 14 million. There is always a deficit 
of about 27% year on year. And uh, uh, the annual production of briquettes, for example, is standing at around 2.4 million kilos. Uh, idea. So every, every, every attempt that is being made to close that demand gap is a business opportunity. And so several um, private sector companies have come up to be able to produce this. So we have small and medium enterprises that are doing a lot of work in trying to convert, uh, you know, the sugar industry waste bagasse into, into, into high calorie briquettes that are then sold to institutions and uh, and um, and uh, and industries and and for me this is this is a good opportunity for example even the chamber members to be able to access these alternative sources to to fuel wood and uh, and and probably at a more a lower cost and while strengthening that value chain and providing markets for small and medium enterprises to be able to thrive while achieving their own energy efficiencies reducing on energy cost and eventually mitigating effects on climate change. So if you go to the market, you'll find, you know, uh, companies like Vuma Biofuels, Acacia Innovations, Lean Energy Solutions, trying to be able to supply the market with this kind of product, which is much more efficient as you would compare to rely on fuel wood, which then leads to a lot of deforestation. So that is another aspect where I think energy efficiency is at play in this market and would be very useful for, uh, for members to, uh, you know, like tap into and see how they can be involved in the value chain. I know other colleagues who are in the panel today will also talk about other, you know, uh, waste to energy uh, solutions and, um, and products that are out there in the market and we can pick up other discussion at that point. Now, the last one is actually not to give, you know, um, our resilience and, um, and adaptation solutions more of a technology heavy uh, kind of um, a, a arrangement. And, and here is, uh, you know, a look at a, a very simple model that um, we have come across that has really helped to be able to, you know, drive uh, mitigation, drive conservation. Uh, so conservation enterprises, I think, is one of the opportunities that can be looked at in more detail. And uh, and 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 I want to I want to take an example of, um, you know, uh, very very localized interventions and uh, by enterprises that are actually providing markets for rural communities. So, you know, uh, providing a market-based and sustainable incentive for conservation enterprises, I think is one of the ways that can really help mitigate effects of climate change. Assume, uh, take an example of maybe uh, the value chain around uh, gums and resins in, uh, in Northern Kenya and other ASAL areas in Kenya. And this is actually part of a very important segment of both local and uh, international pharmaceutical, uh, you know, uh, uh, supply chains. So if, uh, for example, we would take more interest, uh, maybe through the National Chamber of Commerce and the membership of this chamber, that we promote such enterprises, you know, and, uh, and, and it's no doubt that they are expanding uses of gums and resin, for example, you know, the export market out there is about six to eight metric tons annually. Um, uh, East African countries, let's say, for example, Ethiopia is only doing three metric, uh, 3,000 metric tons annually. Kenya and Somalia are doing a, a, a joint 2 point, uh, um, I mean, 2,700 tons annually. I mean, that is, that is just very little of what the demand is out there. Uh, this is a 240 million uh, per year industry that if supported would create a lot of trickle down effect to the pastoralist aggregators who most of them are doing this for, you know, so to sustain their indigenous conservation practices while benefit and, uh, and, support, and support their livelihood. So uh, there are several companies that are already involved in the process of ensuring that such conservation value chains and uh, indigenous conservation uh, enterprises are, are, are promoted across the sector. I would finalize by, you know, just bringing it out to the members that, uh, you know, there's a lot of importance around focusing on SMEs, climate action and green jobs. And uh, as you are aware, around 98% of, uh, you know, 98% um, uh, 90, 90, 
of all businesses in Kenya are actually SMEs, and, and uh, you know, 30% of the jobs created annually in Kenya uh, is as a result of this segment of, uh, of SMEs. And uh, uh, to date, it's been documented very well that 3% of, of the local GDP is actually is actually contributed by SME. So this is a very important factor that if we want to create meaningful resilience, if we want to create meaningful response to effects of climate change, either from the mitigation or the adaptation uh, with adaptation approaches, then it's good to look at the 7.4 million SMEs that are in Kenya. Assuming we just take get about 1.5 million of them which are licensed to do business, then um, it will still create a lot of uh, a lot of impact. I want to conclude by saying that uh, you know in the recent study on climate financing landscape, and I think this is very for, important very important for us to look at. The role of adaptation SMEs has been overemphasized. That it is one of the ways that we can achieve you know green transition and adaptation and uh, and resilience. But then only seven percent of the climate financing went to adaptation. So I think there is a lot of need to have tailored financing, market linkages, and technology that can be able to drive and make use of the local and cross-border opportunities that are available with us, you know, uh, technology transfer and strengthening on market. So what I would do is just to call up on, um, you know, the members of this chamber to be able to fulfill one of the critical mandates that I saw and I have, um, you know, uh, followed very well. You know, it's about market access and commercial interaction in the context of trying to mitigate and uh, create a better resilient uh, market for all of us. So back to you, uh, Maxwell. And this is part of the, uh, the, the, the the part of the uh, the activities, part of the intervention that, of course, KCV along with the other market players are willing to intervene and are will continue to intervene to realize, uh, you know, market access and commercial interaction that is geared towards unlocking private sector investments into resilience and climate change. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Victor. You've hit a lot of uh, very, very pertinent notes there. And I'm glad that um, you know we're putting SMEs at the heart of this whole climate and resilience um, initiative and agenda. So I'll very quickly um, turn it over to um, our members. We we'll start spotlighting with um, Emily Waiter. Emily Waiter is the uh, Coca-Cola Africa's Public Affairs Director. So Emily, the screen is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um... Maxwell, I hope you can all hear me clearly. You know, as uh, Victor was speaking and he talked about the imp implications of climate change and energy, uh, I just uh, we just experienced a huge uh, uh, power outage in our area. So I, I hope I'll be able to hold till the end of my presentation. I've only been given roughly eight minutes to speak, so I'll be very uh, quick and hopefully you should be able to uh, uh, hear me. So thank you again for the introduction and uh, great to be amongst everyone here today. Uh, so today's um, theme and um, subject very much resonates uh, with us at Coca-Cola, much more so uh, the significant unprecedented impact the uh, pandemic um, has had and the learnings we've had, even from an environmental um, health people perspective and just the interconnected nature of, of our subject today. So um, as Victor had mentioned, I, I lead public affairs for, for Africa. And I also sit in a number of uh, boards, uh, including the East Africa Business Council and uh, also the Governing Council of Kenya Private Sector Alliance, where this, this subject is also very uh, uh, topical. So I'll share my slides and um, I'll take you through what we are doing at Coca-Cola. I hope you can see the slides, everybody. Yeah, we can. Go ahead. All right. So, um, uh, so this morning, I just want to tell you a quick, give you a quick story on Coca-Cola and our commitment to sustainability. I'll, I'll be a bit general and then maybe double click, click on one area that's very we're very passionate about. Uh, so. Um, 
first of all, we've had a very long history of sustainability le leadership from the first bottle that we created in 1900, which was a refillable glass bottle, to 1934 when we had when we had the first woman serve on the board of a major company. And more recently, when we come to the 2000s, you see that we had even invented what we call a, a, a plant bottle, a 100% uh, a plastic bottle made of plant. Um, in 2010, we aggressively started driving the agendas around economically empowering women. Uh, we also made commitments on, on, on water and, and as well as climate change. And um, until, until where we are today, in fact, 2020 was a significant year for us because it was the conclusion of 10 year sustainability initiatives uh, that we had set out. And I'm glad to report on, on some of them where we have made some significant milestones that we will use as the platform to launch our next um, 10 year strategy on sustainability. So our, Overall um, purpose as a company is to refresh the world and make a difference. So as much as we will be focusing on uh, refreshing the world with our um, innovative beverages, we also want to do it in a way that makes a difference for every, everyone in the, in, in the society as well as our environment. Um, as I was thinking about this topic, I. I, I realized that literally everything that we do in our business and the really the foundation of what we sell, which is beverages, is, is all connected with climate. Without water, we cannot produce our beverages. With, without, um, without the right climate, we cannot uh, have sustainable agriculture. Without people that are able to um, um, enjoy our beverages, we are not able to um, sell. And, and I think this, this slide pretty much summarizes how we view climate in our business and especially so how we view it in Africa. So our overriding objective under climate is to have 25% um, absolute uh, emission reduction by 2030 and um, and also, sorry, to have a 25% absolute emission reduction, it was actually 2020, which we achieved. And then the aspiration was to be net zero, to have net, to have net zero emissions by 2050, which is uh, an ambitious plan for the business. And it's being done in a very scientific way, not just because um, it's, it's the flavor of the month and, and it's what everybody is talking about right now, but what we've actually done is scientifically gone down to our business and identified to the, to the very last detail, what each and every area of our activity, including the supply chain, how this impacts climate change. And so we are able to measure this in a very refined and scientific way. So we have a long way to go, even though we have already achieved a 25% reduction on climate change. Uh, the next pillar for us is also on around um, water. We live in a water stressed continent and I could spend a whole day telling you stories about some of the challenges we experience in, in, in Africa. And, and in one of them, I think you all remember the most prolific experience we've had, which was the day zero in Cape Town. And you know, literally industry communities came to a standstill because there was just really no water. And this highlighted systemic failings, but have, it, it, it also offered us an unparalleled, unparalleled opportunity to reimagine our future around, um, around water. As the virus spread um, through Africa, the water crisis was magnified even further. As, as you all remember, I mean, when the campaigns around um, control, containing the virus came about, it was all about washing, um, washing our hands. And I think this is when it really became clear that climate change, industrialization, and population growth continue to deepen the intensity of water crisis on the continent. So 10 years ago, we set out to replenish 100% of the water we use in our beverages. So anything to do with production of our beverages, including our actual beverages, we committed to replenish. And we achieved a great result by last year, where we had 97% um, water replenished um, in the continent, including in Kenya and 6 million impacted by 2020 uh, as well. And, and the great news here is more than 25% of the 6 million were actually 
from Kenya. So we've, we've benefited a lot as a country on, on, on this uh, water initiative. Uh, the next big one for us is, of course, um, the topical issue around uh, uh, world without, we call it world without waste uh, in, our, in our company, but uh, it's, it's really the whole uh, conversation around plastics and what um, the world envisions in how we are going to manage plastic waste. And in fact, not just plastic waste, but all other waste that uh, uh, industries are responsible for um, alongside with communities. So I think from where we sit in 2018, we, had, we, made a, we had a very ambitious goal. Uh, even though we had been recycling before, it became very, very clear. It was really just a drop in the ocean because as long as you do not bring people to the table, you're not able to resolve the issue of plastic. Even though we were a key player in this space, we could not, um, we, we cannot avoid the fact that there are many other players uh, in, the plas in the plastic world. In Kenya alone, there's more than 800 companies that package their food or beverages or medication, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever kind of uh, product that requires packaging in this country. There's more than 800 companies involved in, in, in this space. And unfortunately, we are not structured in a way that enables us to recycle. So, what we set out to do is, first of all, we made a commitment to, dis, um, to, to collect and uh, recycle the equivalent of 100% of all the packaging we use uh, in, our, in our trade. And this is by 2030. Uh, why we did this is because before you even go out and ask others to be a part of your initiative, you need to also show that, you need to also demonstrate that you, you have done the same. The second important thing that we had to do was also you know, bring about circularity of waste. So by creating packaging that contains at least 50% recycled material by 2030. So what this means is that if, if, if this goes through or if we're able to drive this, the plastic that you see out in the environment, it can be reused back in our packaging. And what that does is that it closes the loop on, on the materials that we use and reduces the stress on the environment. And of course, the, 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 you know, the, the relationship that this has with the climate change and pollution. Uh, one of the objectives I've not put here is that we also purpose to ensure that we have 95% recyclability of material. What I mean by that is that not every plastic is recyclable. Um, I don't know whether uh, um, another speaker will be able to speak to that later, but just not having recyclable plastic also poses a challenge. So what we have done is ensure that all our plastics are um, recyclable. Um, in Africa, 95%, and I believe in Kenya, we are 100% recyclable. But here's the catch. Not all, not all plastics in Kenya are recyclable. And so we have a role to play in bringing together government uh, businesses that are involved in this space to make material recyclable. We've had some really, really good successes so far. Uh, specific to Kenya, we started the World Without Waste Initiative in 2018. Uh, we came together with like-minded organizations. We had enough data to show that only 5% of the plastics in the environment were being recycled. And this is PET bottles in Kenya. And I'm glad to report that by the end of 20, um, 2019, we had attained a 36% recyclability rate. We were on track to get to 50% recyclability last year, uh, sorry, recycling rate last year, but because of the pandemic, our recycling initiatives were greatly um, disrupted because obviously we couldn't have waste pickers in the environment because of the lockdowns. There was a lot of um, challenge moving um, uh, trucks from one point to another due to restrictions, but we are slowly getting back and, I, and I'm glad to report that uh, we're still back on track and we hope to report uh, at least a 45% uh, recycling rate at the end of this year if there are no further disruptions. And if we keep up at this pace, you can imagine we'll get to a point where we are at 100% recycling. But again, it still will take a lot to, for us to get to that space. So it's not as easy as it seems because out of the 800 plus companies that are recycling, I would say less than 20% are involved in these initiatives. So we have to bring everyone else along. Emily, I'll give you one more minute. 
<laughs> okay. So um, I think I just have two or three last slides. So the other one, and, and they're not as topical as the ones I've talked about. So it's our initiatives around women and youth economic empowerment, because they're a key anchor in our business. Uh, we do this through access to business skills training, access to financial services and, and mentorship. And we have um, uh, exceeded our 2020 target globally, which was to empower 5 million women. We, in fact, reached 6 million women globally. And in Kenya, Kenya being the single, single largest um, country contributor with 800,000 women imp impacted. Um, we are also taking action on sugar and we do this by reducing uh, sugar in some of our beverages. We evolve recipes um, to, to have different kinds of drinks. So we're we not just in the carbonated soft drinks uh, space, but you'll find us in water, tea, and even dairy, coffee, and, um, and many more that we have uh, planned. Outside the bottle, we've uh, changed our packaging. We have uh, con convenient packages that are of different sizes. Um, we provide information on nutrition on our packaging in an open way, even if it is not required legally. And we do not advertise to children below uh, 12. And um, we are also committed to sustainably sourcing our key agricultural ingredients. This is a huge space for us uh, in this um, climate change conversation. Um, the other one that we are known for is um, championing on health. And especially now during the COVID pandemic, we have a pioneering partnership to improve the availability of life-saving medicine and the uptake of health services by sharing and leveraging our expertise, uh, you know, our distribution power and the ability to reach literally every corner of um, the country. And then um, of course, for us going forward, if we are to really deliver on our sustainability initiatives, it will be critical to build um, relationships, strong partnerships that will take us to the next level. We really cannot do this alone. And uh, this is what we will be doing a lot of for the next 10 years. And I'm sure that with some of the members of AMCHAM, we'll be reaching out in some of these initiatives. And that's my presentation. Thank you uh, very much, Maxwell, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, it, it is fascinating just to hear the sort of work that you're doing at Coca-Cola. And as you say, this is going to be a collective effort and we really do um, extend the invitation on your behalf to members to partner and then see how we can uh, move forward this agenda. So I'll very quickly turn it over to John Seekant. John Seekant is the founder um, and uh, founder of the Wildfire Wildlife Foundation and uh, an environmentalist, um, long-standing member of AMCHAM. So John, you have 10 minutes. Please go ahead and uh, share your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Max. This is really quite an honor. I've been a member of, you, of the uh, American uh, Chamber of Commerce of Kenya since 1998. 1998, it was um, then the American Business Association. We have here a photo of me in my younger days with the then outgoing ambassador, Ms. Prudence bush -Nellitz. I want to stay on this slide for a second because I want to set the um, background, the context of how we started the Wildlife Foundation. So um, I am a lawyer and then I'm admitted to the New York Bar. So it, this is an interesting photo because this takes place after a meeting of the American Business Association back in 1998. This is after the bomb blast, which, which our US ambassador, Ms. Prudence bush -Nell, comes back to Kenya to finish her tour of duty. And lo and behold, I mean, we're yakking, uh, she and I together. Um, I'd like to, I'd like, really like to commend uh, this platform in the, in, in the support that it has given me over the decades, the decades of my work in biodiversity protection here in East Africa. I'd like to highlight Johnny Carson was a, was a great friend. He proceeds then to become uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary of State for Africa. Um, our former US ambassador uh, to Kenya, Mr. Mark Bellamy, was pivotal in 207 during the election in, in, in protecting the ecosystem of Nairobi National Park uh, through emergency funding uh, through Congress. Mr. Michael Ranneberger was a huge champion of my, of my work. He was fantastic. He, he used his great authority in fundraising millions of shillings for our programs. And then most recently, Mr. Robert Godek, who was a great champion of our work. Um, so um, 
So let's go on. So uh, uh, can, we, can, can we go on to the next slide? The next slide. Just a background on, on where we are in biodiversity. So th this is an overview of some of the major Kenya protected areas uh, within, in, in Kenya. First, Nairobi National Park, the Lakes District, Masai Mara, and Baseli, Laikipia, Savo, and then the coastal areas. And all these areas are under severe threat due to um, pre predominantly uh, la uh, land encroachment. Um, we're, ha we're experiencing a lot of uh, urgent la land subdivision. So um, I'd like to point out that, um, that although we've seen a lot of economic uh, increases in, in, in um, in uh, the, um, the demographics of Kenya, uh, the alternative, the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the result of it is, is a lot of uh, land, a land subdivision. So, which is, a, which is a real difficulty because of the loss of, severe loss of biodiversity. Um, I'd like to point out that um, whereas the ambassadors have, uh, where we are now is with the US-Kenya Free Trade Agreement. And I'm really glad for that because uh, in my own ba uh, background in, um, from Korea, Korea has seen free trade agreements to the great success of the Korean economy. But what I'd like to point out is that as we approach the US-Kenya Free Trade Agreement, I've been imploring many of the negotiations to uh, bear in mind what is unique to Kenya and what is unique to Kenya is its fantastic biodiversity. And we would like, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I can impact this to reflect um, greater protection of uh, its, its natural resources, sustainable natural resources. I was chatting with Max uh, recently and I point out that I was um, at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And the Library of Congress is uh, the largest library for the United States. And it supports Congress in um, knowledge and in information. It has over 1 million items of information. So I'm in the Library of Congress. I'm taking out my books. And I'm looking at, I'm reading uh, some of the great uh, US poets, Langston Hughes and Sylvia Plath and myself. And I look up in the rotunda of the Library of Congress, which was built in 1814. And I notice that there's this beautiful panel of um, the various spheres of knowledge. And I look at the various spheres of knowledge and they have uh, Europe and they have the Americas and they have Islam and they have many, many different spheres of knowledge. But one thing that is omitted is Africa. And I take that uh, to mean that Thomas Jefferson, who was the architect of the Library of Congress, was himself a slave trader. And so I think that's a huge admission, uh, omission. And I feel very strongly that the US-Kenya Free Trade uh, Agreement is, is a welcome opportunity for US companies to come into this area. I think it's long overdue. And um, I think it's a very powerful opportunity uh, for the region. But again, the issue is, is how to do it, how to, and, and, and sustainability of natural resources is, is certainly a key pillar uh, to which um, the U.S. Free Trade Agreement um, to Kenya uh, has got to amplify. Um, so I'd like to, um, so let's go back to, let's read the Constitution of Kenya 2010, Chapter 5, Land and Environment, Article 69, Obligations in Respect to the Environment, Article 69, Obligations in Respect to the Environment, the state shall, A, ensure sustainability sustainability, exploitation, utilization, management, and conservation of the environment and natural resources, and ensure the equitable sharing of the, uh, of the accruing benefits. E, protect genetic resource and biological diversity. G, eliminate process and activities that are likely to endanger the environment. Seven, 70, enforcement of, in, uh, of, in, of environmental rights. Two, on application under clause one, the court may make May, may make any order or give any direction it considers appropriate. Provision A, to prevent, stop, or discontinue any act or admission that is harmful to the environment. B, to compel any public officer to take measures 
to prevent or discontinue any act or admission that is harmful to the environment. Can you think of the next slide, Ava? Yeah, thank you. Wildlife Conservation and Management Act 2013, preliminary. The implementation of this act shall be guided by the following principles. Wildlife conservation and management shall be devolved wherever possible and appropriate to those owners and managers of land where wildlife occurs. B, conservation and management of wildlife shall entail effective public participation. C, wherever possible, the conservation and management of wildlife shall be encouraged using an ecosystem approach. D, wildlife conservation and management shall be encouraged and recognized as a form of land use on public community and private land. Can we continue? Yes, National Wildlife Strategy 2013, a strategic plan required by the Wildlife Conservation Management Act 2013. Pillar one, resilient ecosystems and species addresses the prioritization, planning and protection of ecosystems and species. This pillar emphasizes a comprehensive assessment of the status and conservation priorities for ecosystems and species, development of frameworks for integrated planning and the effective coordination and implementation of species protection and wildlife security in the country, including reducing human wildlife conflict and promoting coexistence. Goal one, maintain and improve habitat and ecosystem integrity, maintain and improve habitat and ecosystem integrity to reduce biodiversity loss, protect ecosystem function, enhance connectivity and increase resilience. National um, strategy one, identify priority ecosystems for conservation action, Increase understanding of ecosystem functioning through identification, prioritization, and securing of key conservation areas and ecosystems to focus and enhance the effectiveness of conservation investments and interventions. Two, support integrated data driven land use planning, support integrated data driven land use planning at regional, transboundary, national, county protected area, and ecosystem level to enhance the protection of wildlife habitat, ecosystem services, and reduce biodiversity loss. Three, protect, rehabilitate, restore wildlife habitats and their connectivity. Protect, rehabilitate, and restore the connectivity of wildlife habitats, including forest savannas, freshwater marine, and mountain ecosystems to increase the resilience of key habitats and ecosystems. Is there any more of this? One more slide. Um, so uh, I'd like to. Um, there's also other rele relevant legislation. There's the Constitution, there's the Lands Act, there's the Environmental Management Coordination Act, there's also physical planning. Oh, so um, we began the Wildlife Foundation in 2000. Um, there, there, there were two cases. Um, first, I'd like to go back. We, we, I'll discuss the Wildlife Foundation in just a moment, but I'd like to point out that the um, the locus standi for most of this is, are the two parastatals, the Kenya Wildlife Service and the National Environment Management Authority. And I personally have had some very bitter experiences with both these agencies through two inconsistent um, results. One was in 206 with the Jimmy Bora Housing Project, and then most recently in 2019 with the Standard Gauge Railway. And um, you know, we'll go into why business should think about biodiversity. And the point is, is that in both cases in the Jimmy Boer housing project, which was an investment of a housing project in the heart of the um, ecosystem to which I protect, which is the Ave Pikuiti ecosystem, uh, which really served to ruin it, it was a financial loss. It was a huge financial loss. And now we're all struck and, to, and, and we lost, we lost under EMCA uh, at the Jimmy Boer in 206. John? The Standard Gauge Railway also in 2019 was a huge financial loss. So, so it pays for businesses to be environmentally compliant in Kenya and, and to understand the laws. Okay, so now we, 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 we begin with the Wildlife Foundation. We begin in 2000. The Wildlife Foundation was established in 2000, dedicated to conserving Kenya's wildlife dispersal areas. Our conservation programs include community conservancies, which incentivize local communities to share land with wildlife. I'd like to, uh, the community, conserv the conservancy to which the Wildlife Foundation protects is the Naritanoi Community Conservancy. And I'd like to point out that USA, no, let's go back there. I haven't finished, Ava, don't go. Yeah, I'm gonna stay on the slide for a second. I'd like to point out that USAID was a instrumental agency to create the conservancy movement in Kenya. 
And today, um, I, I, the area under protection has more than quadrupled under the conservancy movement. And, um, and I, I, I think there's a, 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 huge, uh, a huge support from USAID in that regard. Um, John, yes? John um, you are already out of time. I oh, will okay. So, I will one minute to summarize. So okay, that let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's keep going. Conflict mitigation, community rangers, the TWF Center. We do all these great things. Host the secretariat. Let's keep going. Slides, slides, slides. There we go. This is a map. What are we looking at? We see Nairobi National Park. And we do, we do a lot of activities with the, with the, with the Wildlife Foundation. So we keep going. What else, what else do we have in our slides? Ava, one more slide. And then we're expanding. And we're expanding with the uh, Athikapiti Wildlife uh, Community Association to expand the wildlife co corridors. And, and, and ironically, what we're doing right now is we're trying to uh, restore corridors that have been blocked by the past decade or so of some really poor uh, infrastructure planning. So as we are aware, the infrastructure that continues in Kenya you know, it was a double-edged sword. It's increasing um, economic activity, but it is uh, definitely destroying a lot of wildlife areas, which is really, really sad. He, uh, sad. Game count data, and you can see evidence of the wildlife in our area. It persists. Um, it, we counted um, jealously, and and we're here. These these are these are our creatures which we protect. Okay, and I would like to say thank you to you, Max. And I would like to encourage everyone in this forum to get in touch with us, us at the Wildlife Foundation. We are continuously looking for partners in our work and in our platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Indeed, um, you know, we do, we do acknowledge and appreciate the wonderful work that you're doing at the Wildlife Foundation. Um, so let me quickly turn it over to um, Mumbi. Mumbi Kega is the public affairs leader for Africa at Doe Chemicals. Mumbi, the screen is yours. Wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, thank you, Maxwell. Uh, I know now we are rushing because of time. Uh, I'm so happy to uh, join this dialogue. And, and for us, I think the key question here, as Max was, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I look after public affairs for Africa. Uh, the key question here is how can we work together to solve today's complex challenges? And I think the dialogue today is actually at a way, one of the ways that we can really work together to actually do that. So at DAO, we are guided by our, our purpose to use our material science uh, expertise to collaborate with other partners to deliver this sustainable future that we all desire. Uh, just if I go uh, quickly through my slides, and uh, uh, I will not be, uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, just in the words of our CEO, uh, global CEO, who says that a sustainable future is attained but uh, attainable, but only if we, are, we continue to tackle these issues head on, hold ourselves accountable and work together to enable new science and technology based solutions that directly address both climate change and plastic waste. And this is exactly what we've been trying to do as a company because we are a material science company. We are, the still, we are at the start of everything that we do. We provide solutions to uh, the companies that produce items that you use every day. And this is important for us. Just to give you an idea how uh, we touch you every day so that we understand why sustainability is so important for us as a company. Uh, chemistry also needs to be sustainable, meaning that we need to make sure that we are bringing the best solutions that can really sustain and protect the environment for the future. We meet you in packaging, we meet you in your homes, in beddings, in your footwear, in your personal care, your home care. So we are make, and in many, many in, in infra, infrastructure uh, products. So meaning that we are with you in multiple ways. Uh, and this way, we have to be very, very careful and we have, be, we have to be deliberate in how we are using our chemistry and how we are developing our chemistry to be able to be sustainable for the environment. And I'll take you through uh, the journey that we've taken in the past few years uh, in our sustainability agenda. Uh, and as the global population continues to, to grow, you're seeing that we have immense social progress. Uh, we have rise in living standards, and this is great. That has helped to enable this progress and our products and applications continue to enrich 
people's lives everywhere. And we are very proud of it. However, we recognize that while societies have benefited immensely from the industrial innovation, it has come at a cost. And we are seeing a global uh, cl you know, climate crisis, biodiversity loss, uh, environmental degradation, much of which is due to unsustainable use of resources, as even Emily and the other speakers have said. So there, there are some, uh, these are some of the defining challenges of, uh, of our time, and they pose a great threat to life on, on Earth. And I think we have an obligation for all of us to work together to make a difference. So when I come back to Dow and what you've done, we have our 2025 sustainability goals. We established these goals six years ago, and we have been moving very closely to just track them. And these are the seven uh, goals you see at the bottom. And we've been working very, very uh, hard on them. But uh, we, what we're doing is that we're applying what we call a blueprint thinking, where we drive um, uh, collaborations to change the entire system and act, achieve that transformative change that we all seek. But in 2020, we took uh, our committed, commitment to the next level. What we said is that they, there are some challenges today that require us to come on board very quickly and address, and address them specifically. And those are the challenges that, those are the targets that we identified in 2020. These are carbon reduction and eliminating plastic waste. And in these two areas, which are in red, which you see here in red, uh, we then identify protecting the climate, stopping the waste and closing the loop as the key areas we're going to focus on. And in my today's presentation, I'm going to focus on these two areas because this is where we are putting a lot of effort and this is where we feel we can really make great impact, you know, impact uh, today. If I go specifically to protecting uh, the climate and I'll also talk about the other, the other two because they are intertwined. Our Protect the Climate target is our commitment to implement and advance technologies to manufacture products using fewer resources. And I think this is a commitment we are seeing even in other, with other companies. How can companies come together and use fewer resources to make what they're already making? And that help, and we also help our customers reduce their carbon footprint. So Dow, in terms of our commitment, intends to be carbon neutral by 2050. And additionally, Dow will reduce its net annual carbon emissions, at least by 50 per, 50 percent from its 2020 uh, uh, base. When it comes to stopping the waste, and I will take from where even Emily stopped because I think this is something that we can see companies really focusing on because it's very, very critical. And even if you take Kenyan case, stopping the waste, closing the loop is a it's an issue that we have to really, really focus on. And that's why we will talk a bit about it uh, going forward. You know, you know, plastic has to stop, uh, you know, waste has to stop. Too much in the rivers, landfill and oceans, and we've talked about it. So our plastic plan consists of two goals, stopping the waste and closing the loop. Stopping the waste, what do we want to do? We want to invest in collaborating in key technologies and infrastructure to significantly increase uh, global recycling. So what are our commitments here? Our commitments here is that by 2020, 2030, that will help stop the waste by enabling one million metric ton of plastic to be collected, reused, or recycled through our direct actions and partnerships. When you come to closing the loop, this is our internal DAO commitment, where we are saying that we are committed to redesigning and promoting reusable and recyclable packaging applications. So our commitment here is that by 2035, DAO will help close the loop by having 100% 100% of our products sold into the packaging applications be reusable and recyclable. And that's what even um, the other presenter uh, mentioned earlier, but these commitments are things that we are very, very deliberate about. So if I go forward to just really look at how we are getting there, um, we have outlined three key areas that we, going to help us get to where we want to be? How can we close, stop the waste and close the loop in a way that we know will work with stakeholders and get that done? So we are doing this by keeping plastics out of the environment. And we are working with many stakeholders to get this. And how are we doing this? We are participating in some projects, infrastructure projects that really enable uh, plastic recycling. For example, we're already prototyping some road, uh, plastic roads in markets, um, uh, even in South Africa, in other markets that are able to really show us how best we can do this with other partners. When it comes to 
to communities, we have projects that are going to communities in educating them on how really to manage these materials when they come to the market to the communities and how they can use them uh, productively. And Lisa will talk about it in essence when it comes to Kenyan case. When you look at how we want to work with partners, we want to increase impact through partnerships. What you see here are three partners, but they're just few of the many, just a number of the many that we have created around, uh, around the globe and African specification, if you look at Africa and how we are working. Um, so we, in, in partnership, mostly we want to advance our recycling technologies and infrastructure, and this we are working together. And I, why we come to partnership is to, build skill because you cannot work alone. If you bring a sizable partner, you then push yourselves and you can create that skill and the solutions to waste management then becomes uh, more impactful. The last one is really driving, delivering a circular economy solution. And this for us, we are looking specifically in investing in mechanical recycling and offering recycled plastics as part of our product portfolio, meaning that the plastics that come out need to really, really be put back in the portfolio and be brought back into the marketplace as a solution for other for the companies to use them as materials to produce items. And in this case, we're already working with companies in Kenya, uh, specifically Mr. Green, and I'll talk a bit about it. And also we have other, other projects that we're doing across Africa. In Nigeria, for example, we already uh, created uh, post-consumer uh, materials uh, that are already coming back for uh, uh, to be utilized in the marketplace uh, after it has been collected, especially for sachet water uh, packaging. I want to go to the last slides that I have because I want to spend a bit of time here. This is um, what we are doing. Mombi, you have a minute. You have a minute. Yeah, this is about, uh, this is uh, in Kenya, what we're doing is that in many developed markets, we have seen that recycling of uh, a rigid, uh, plastic is much easier than flexible. So in Kenya, we are focusing on flexible. As Emily said, she's fo they're focusing on rigid a lot, but we are focusing on the flexible, which is the most tedious one to, uh, uh, to recycle. In this case, we are working with uh, Mr. Green uh, to incentivize the collectors of this plastic, and we take it back to make sure that it is ending up in creating post-consumer raisins and in other alternative end uses. Uh, and we can then pick it and then we also where we are not able to mechanically recycle. We also help in deploying a mobile application, uh, application an app, like an Uber-like app, where we are helping residents to uh, sort on site in their homes, and we collect that material that goes out for recycling, and that material does not end up in the landfills. And we're working also with Unilever uh, project to, in the youth and to just um, work with uh, school programs where we can encourage schools to recycle. We are also working on, um, uh, programs to uh, educate communities, uh, cleanup programs, engagements with uh, uh, communities in terms of awareness and also creating zero waste communities uh, around informal settlements. And lastly, we know that we cannot do this alone. So our partnerships are very important. We are founding partners of the Kenya Extended Producer Responsibility Organization and a partner of the UN Habitat Waste Wise Cities Initiative and have worked with others uh, to do a lot of things. And most importantly, our customers come to play. We've worked with PIL, which is our customer, to create a sustainable silage bag, which is directly impacting dairy farming in, in Kenya. So working with these organizations uh, are really creating impact. Dow aims to have impact in communities where we live in and work globally. And we are pleased to have the opportunity to share with you some of these strategies. And we thank you so much for uh, coming with us. And we call upon all of you to join us and we go on to create a sustainable environment that we all desire. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much, Mundi. I want to very quickly turn over um, the screen to Rebecca. Rebecca. Good Jan, I hope I pronounced your name properly, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is partner at uh, Hudson and Sander, um, who are actually um, members of Amcham and have been critical in shaping this uh, Amcham Force for Good, Business as a Force for Good initiative. So Rebecca, over to you for the discussion. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to all of the speakers. I think we've had some really interesting insights from a kind of a range of backgrounds. So two big global, um, 
um, manufacturers um, and uh, a foundation, but also I thought Victor's work with the SME sector on the energy transformation um, was, was fascinating. And I think there's things for us all to learn from that. Um, this is open to any of the, any of the, um, anyone on this call at all. So if you do have a question, please either type it into the box at the side. And if we, if we can build it in, then we then do. But if you'd like to answer any of the questions, I'm going to put them first of all to our speakers. But if you have anything you would like to add to that, please put your camera on and you can join in the conversation. We'd like to hear from everyone and we want this to be as interactive as possible. So first of all, I just want to start by, um, perhaps asking our speakers, and I might, I, I think I might start with Emily, actually, I want to ask why does, I mean, the, the, the subject we're here to talk about today, why does climate, nature and resilience matter for business in Kenya specifically? And what are the main motivators for Coca-Cola um, for your work in, in that area? Um. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Um, I think this question really is, is, it's not even a Coca-Cola question. It's for anyone that's doing business in any way or form today. Um, I think we all know, and we've had this say time and time again. Um, sorry, I hope you can see me. Yes. yes. But, uh, business cannot succeed in a failing society. The, so there's two ways to look at it, first of all. You cannot survive as a business if the society around you is failing. Africa is growing, Africa is thriving, the young population is expanding, our consumers are broadening, the access to markets is becoming important, access to ingredients is becoming important. But let me just give you a very small example. I cannot sell a bottle of Dasani in a place where people cannot even have drinking water. Yeah. If people are successful in the environment where I'm doing my business, then it makes sense for me to do business. It's that simple. So every business should start thinking this way. And, and there's something else that I, I want to point out, just the simple fact that, and this is something very controversial, the fact that less than 4% of, uh, or rather Africa's contribution to climate change is less than 4%. So you would ask then why is there so much focus on businesses in Africa doing something about it? So I like to capture it in two ways. So first of all, it is very important that we do not continue making the mistakes that have already been made in the past. We, we correct that. But at the same time, we're really looking forward to the partnership and support of the industrialized nations to do their part as well, because we can only do a reduction of climate change by 4%. What about the other? 90, 96% that needs to be addressed. So um, we are also countries that are in the epicenter of industrializing. Uh, for us to, be, to, to get to the economic um, uh, success that we need to get to, we need to do it sustainably. But that also means it's, it's costlier for us. It's difficult for us to, uh, to become you know, more prosperous as nations. So we must work hand in hand as nations, as companies to push forward. And the reality is this, we've seen what the pandemic did. If you do not take, take care of the basics in society, you, everything can come to a standstill. And, and um, so going forward, it's, I urge that every business that uh, is in this space, no matter what size, just play a role in, in um, addressing climate change. I think that's, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I also think that while Africa might only be responsible for 4% of you know, the carbon emissions that are affecting and driving the climate crisis around the world, Africa is going to, well, not just Africa, but a lot of, sub a lot of the Southern hemisphere are going to be the ones who suffer the worst impacts of it. So, so yeah, I think, I think the Northern hemisphere and the West does have a real responsibility to this. Um, I'd like to go to maybe um, maybe Joan, coming from a sort of foundation point of view. What opportunities do you see for value creation? How do you see businesses can really benefit? And I, I'm asking you because you're not from that business background or the foundation is not in that space. But how, how what do you see as the op op opportunities for businesses in terms of value creation through a real focus on climate, nature and resilience? What does it look like from the sort of the NGO perspective? Oh, because you can partner with us. 
you see, for, for example, we're planning a big fundraiser towards the end of the year with, uh, and we're going to do this bicycle race and we're going to do this and this. You know, companies have to demonstrate their environmental uh, commitment. Consumers are very, ad I, as I pointed out maybe earlier today, in New York, I called my mom and her house is under three feet of water. I mean, you know, and again, it's a U.S. Kenya free trade agreement. U.S. companies, as per the AM Chamber, coming into Africa, and you've got to demonstrate as a U.S. company, Coca-Cola, Dow, a Citibank, the Amcham companies that need to demonstrate their commitment to the environment and do partner with us because the Wildlife Foundation, uh, if I may say so, is as good as you're going to get, you know, on um, on 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 good uh, on good environmental practice. I call it state of the art conservation practice committed to the communities, committed to the wildlife protection. You know, I mean, uh, our data and our results are spectacular. Nairobi National Park is, is our focal area. We, Nairobi is the gateway to uh, industry, roads, education, you name it. We still have giraffes. <laughs> we still have lions. We still, we, we still maintain it. And um, so the issue, I, I, you know, it, it just can embellish Dow, Coca-Cola. It's, it's a great um, laurel. It's a crown to, to, to the corporations to, to say, hey, we, we can partner with the Wildlife Foundation because they're doing really great things. And, the, and it would trickle down to the consumer because the consumer today is facing corona, is facing climate change, and they want to support companies uh, that are climate sensitive so they can demonstrate it through, through partnerships and these opportunities with the Wildlife Foundation. We're seeing this actually all over the world. So um, as, as Maxwell said, we, um, we're a, a, a global um, strategic communications agency that's really focused specifically on sustainability and ESG. And we work with clients around the world. And we are seeing, whereas um, perhaps in previous years, there was a lot of pressure coming from the investment community onto companies through their ESG ratings to say, you know, you have got to do better in terms of your environmental and social performance. We're now seeing it come from um, from consumers just as much, and consumers are making very wise choices and are driving some of the um, some of the pressure on on the corporates. Um, I want to go to Victor. Victor, what do you think could be done to create a more conducive environment in Kenya for companies to start investing in climate, nature, and resilience? You're you're doing a lot of work, I know, with SMEs, but. But what is it that what is it what are, what's the infrastructure that might be the political infrastructure that can be put in place to create that environment that's going to push that further? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Rebecca, and uh, I hope I'm audible enough. Uh, so I want to I want to mention on uh, you know building up uh, uh, the momentum. And I think one critical aspect of it is about, uh, you know, taxation, yeah? So from a policy and framework perspective, I think uh, uh, the experience with most of, uh, you know, the enterprises and the actors um, in this sector is about, you know, a lot of taxes that uh, do not actually provide enough room for businesses to be able to save as much as they need to invest in, um, you know, uh, climate resilient initiatives. And so uh, what I think is necessary is for, you know, the government and the public sector to recognize that uh, business intervention in the areas of climate change require a lot more resources. And uh, part of the resources actually should come from their on revenues in addition to what they raise from, from the external world. And if there are subsidies which recognize the effort of these businesses to be able to you know, implement uh, you know, the green transition initiatives, to be able to do you know, recycling, to be able to participate effectively in, for example, a circular economy, then that incentive is, um, is, uh, is, is necessary. Uh, the next one is that um, we know uh, we are aware that there's a lot of um, support that is, uh, you know, currently being said of happening to small and medium enterprises, but I think uh, uh, it needs to be tailored more with the respect to, you know, adaptation and, uh, and, and, and mitigation, so there should be very specific and targeted support 
that are looking at um, interventions and business initiatives that are critically addressing resilience and uh, ensuring that communities transform to, um, to be able to manage uh, the effects of, um, of climate change. And I just want to mention one quick fact around, you know, the pressure that is coming from the consumers for businesses to be able to create sustainable processes and, and products. So, you know, around, um, in one of the studies, around 62% of customers here in Kenya are actually saying that they will only buy from sustainable companies by 2025, right? 2025 is the next five, is the next four years, uh, three, four years from now. So what it means is that, you know, if you look at it from, um, uh, from, from the perspective of, uh, uh, you know, also borrowed from the NGO approach to, uh, uh, to, to, to advocating for climate change and sustainability, is that if that pressure is there, then both the public and the private sector need to find out what they can do now so that consumers do not get to a point where they only have to prefer a few companies to purchase from. So yeah. what has to be done from now has to be public sector supported and private sector supported. Back to you, Rebecca. I think that I think you make a really interesting point. And of course, this is coming on the back of a pandemic with a complete global slowdown where you know taxes are going to have to rise across the world to pay for the, the economic impact of um, the pandemic. So there is going to be less money in consumers' pockets potentially going forward. And to, to be able to make those sustainable choices, we do need to have market forces in place so that those sustainable choices are affordable for, for you know, the average consumers to, to, to be able to drive you know, good practice through. Um, We've had one question from the um, from the audience, um, and I'm going to kind of wind it into one of the questions I wanted to ask you anyway. Um, I think every one of the, your, your presentations talked about partnerships and the partnerships you already have in place. And we know that um, SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals, is one of the most critical because it is the one that creates a network across the world and drives change, um, which is essential. Um, before I come on to ask the, to ask the audience question, I want to I want to ask all of you. So please all feel free to join in. What kind of partnerships do you think would really help to advance um, progress on climate, nature, and resilience in Kenya specifically? I know you all have individual partnerships in place around maybe it's recycling or it's around you know litter collection. It's at lots and lots and lots of different partnerships. Some at a global level and some at a very local level. But are there any other sorts of partnerships that you currently don't see in place that would really help drive the um, sustainability agenda in Kenya? <clears throat> if I could go uh, ahead and answer that, uh, I think we, uh, from our perspective, is that we've tried to carry everyone along. And I think, as uh, we said, we cannot do this alone. And why we carry everyone along is because we want to create a skill for impact that you really, really desire. Uh, but when you look at the ones that really bring great impact is that you want to ensure that even the governments are with us. And the impact of governments being with us then becomes the very fruitful stakeholder when you have them to go to then address these sustainable uh, uh, challenges that we have, uh, sustainability challenges that we have in the marketplace. But I think being able to carry everyone along even when you do not, even your peers, your competitors, everyone, when you think about the whole value chain, this is what a, a viable route would be when you think about a stakeholder base when you go to, uh, to implementing or even to really look for success. So that's what I would see uh, as, as the impact or the, the direction we take. I would have to hear what the others have to say, but I see the role of the government being very, very, very important. And I think that's where we need to put a lot more effort to make sure that even learning from Europe, for example, the Green Deal, how the government is involved and how the other uh, um, value chain players are coming along to deal with the Green Deal. And we're learning from Europe, especially on how they are developing the, the, the agenda using the Green Deal. So these are some of the things that we can really learn from and to really engage in the community uh, where we are. Uh, back to the other speakers, they could probably chip into that uh, conversation. Before we pass it over to the other speakers, maybe I would agree with you. I think the government does play an incredibly important role. And I'm sitting here in London 
Um, and we have exactly the same issues around recycling that you're facing in Kenya. These are global issues. And we see that one of the biggest um, barriers to proper recycling, getting a proper recycling system in, in the UK is a lack of infrastructure, a lack of government investment in this. So while we might be able to collect our, our plastics, we aren't actually able to recycle all of our plastics here. So we have to look for global solutions. And that requires for us to be able to do, you know, to do what needs to be done. It does require government, um, you know, government to prioritize the development of that sort of infrastructure. So yes, I absolutely agree. Um, Joan, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, you're on mute. Here I am. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just put it in the chat group. So, for example, Rosie, Rosie Toilet Tissue. Um, my brother-in-law was a, is a local director for uh, WWF, and he got the Rosie Toilet Tissue to put WWF every 10, 10 cents, you know, with shillings on the toilet tissue. I mean, talk about a wonderful marketing. I mean, Rosie Toilet Tissue sales went out the roof. And I really do want to mention, so again, the U.S.-Kenya Free Trade Agreement, the United States uh, continuing involvement, uh, you know, Kenya will benefit from, um, you know, being, being the gateway to Africa. I mean, you know, Kenya has, uh, has remarkable statistics in terms of our economic growth. And um, yeah, so, so I'm over at the, at the EPZ. And the problem with EPZ is that it's really in demise. I mean, the whole the whole infrastructure that began in the 1990s and, went and so forth, I mean, it's just crumbled to pieces. In any case, uh, it's still going on. MAS is a Sri Lankan company with contracts uh, uh, with Calvin Klein uh, as per AGOA, and uh, they're gonna support us. They, they're gonna take over all our lease payments. I, I, I'm i gonna chase you down in Coca-Cola. You'll see me knock, 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 you know? I do, I do hope you can give me your advice and, and see how we can move forward. Um, we're, we're doing great things with Wildlife Foundation in full confidence. I know the NGO world, NGO world. I mean, you know, I, our biodiversity um, protection results are phenomenal with, with Nairobi National Park. It, it's, it's got to be one of the most challenged ecosystem, the biodiversity landscapes on the planet and the Wildlife Foundation has succeeded in maintaining uh, numbers. Of, of the wildlife, and you're talking, you know, the predators and the undulates and the giraffe and the primates and the birds, because that's what we got to do, right? Because it's got to be sustainability of natural resources, and the sustainability of the natural resources of Kenya is its wildlife. It's its most precious natural resource. We have seen there is no oil, you know, gold, you know, I mean, there's, no, I mean, you know, thank God we don't do semiconductor, you know, like cobalt stuff. It's the wildlife, and we have to protect that. And I'm really glad to, uh, to do what I do. And I'm really glad I've, 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 been, I've, I've uh, come this far with, this, uh, with the American Chamber. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to ask Victor, we've had one of the questions from the audience is thinking about partnerships. Um, one audience member, and I'm sorry, I can't even see it in the, in the, in the chat box now. So I don't know whose name, whose name it is. Someone asked about, they were very interested in, the, um, in what you were saying about the, um, uh, the, the gum opportunity in northern Kenya, um, the gum and resin opportunity in northern Kenya, and they were asking how can small producers, you know, these are, these are smallholders and the, the small communities, how can they build a better partnership with some of the global pharmaceutical companies? What is the, what's needed to make that piece work? Because clearly it's going to have economic impact, a positive economic impact. Um, and, you know, clearly it's going to help the farmer industry become more sustainable. So how do we bring those two very different sort of animals together to create something that is really meaningful? Great. Thanks. Uh, th thanks, Rebecca. And uh, I just want to, 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 to repeat a few, a, few, a few facts. One is the global demand of uh, gums and resins, 6,000 to 8,000 metric tons annually. Uh, locally, uh, Kenya is supplying 1,500 tons annually. Ethiopia is probably doing 3,000 tons annually. Somalia is doing, uh, you know, 1,200 tons annually. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the capacity of uh, local enterprises to be able to aggregate and supply is immense. Uh, I'm talking about an example of an enterprise that can be able to do up to 100 tons 
in a month. And what it means downstream is that it's creating business opportunity and alternative income to an area which would otherwise entirely dependent on livestock products. Now, how do pharmaceutical companies and other intermediaries come in to be able to strengthen this value chain that is very important for the conservation of um, certain tree species in the Northern Kenya, where most communities are actually affected by climate change? One is about markets. So uh, instead of fully supplying the export market that require a lot of logistical arrangements and costs involved, the local pharmaceutical companies can actually secure uh, the aggregator entrepreneurs with specific orders that they can supply and assure quality. So that is number one. Number two, it's about supplying uh, to the export market on a surplus arrangement. So currently, if you go to Northern Kenya, and you know some of these towns, you'll find, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, not bad to trade with foreign um, enterprises, but you'd find them coming down to as low as trying to aggregate from the small older farmers who are there in the village. For this value chain to function properly, there is need to have it a lot more uh, organized and it, there is need to pump in a lot more cash flow into it so that local traders and local enterprises are able to negotiate for terms that favor them in the market. And this cannot happen when, uh, you know, large players in the pharmaceutical sector and any other sector where gums and resin is, um, is, uh, is part of, uh, you know, their raw material. And again, I will repeat, this is a 240 million industry per year and cannot be ignored for a long time if we believe that one of the ways of creating resilience is providing alternative livelihoods. So for the, uh, for the, for the participants who are here, I will be able to share contacts of uh, some of the companies that are doing good business in this and, uh, and they can have the discussion going forward. That's wonderful, thank you. And then I, we've got literally one minute left. I just wanted to ask all of you, what do you think the future looks like in terms of how do you see how do you see sustainability evolving um, in terms of um, nature, climate, and resilience in Kenya? I have I have a very strong view that climate doesn't end at a border. Climate, you know, climate and waste they it's no respect for of borders. So I have a very strong view that we're going to have to see more um, more kind of cross border. Um, uh, uh, partnerships being formed and governments being very willing to do that. Um, but I just wondered if, if the last kind of 30 seconds, if the panel had any thoughts about that. Emily, I saw you nodding. I have a quick, quick you know, I'm the pastor's daughter. I'm from Korea. Hello. And, um, you know, I can't help but feel extremely worried. You know, our losses are significant. The only thing you could do, why I love Kenya, you know, the church is a very strong institution here and I like it. And um, you got to pray to God. Um, and that's where we are. Because you know what? I mean, the challenges are huge. But I would like to say the Wildlife Foundation is 2021 and we're not quitting. So, so for me, very quickly, convergence in dealing with the scale and very nature of global challenges like climate change is inevitable. We are not, no longer going to be in a space where we point fingers at government, point fingers at communities, point fingers at uh, private sector. I think the reality is now here with us. We've seen in Kenya just how when uh, the pandemic struck, when everyone came together, how we were able to address so many challenges quickly. Yeah. I think that's the future. We cannot just sit on opposite sides of the table, um, competing or fighting or po uh, pointing fingers. It's a, it's a common problem. Even communities themselves have a role to play in climate change. I agree. But actually, I think I think there have been some real learnings, some positive learnings coming out of the you know the horrors of the pandemic, and that it is we can can cooperate. We can cooperate at the global level. We can cooperate at a at a community level and we can come together to face an emergency it's just getting the world to realize that this really is the emergency we need to act now yeah uh, i think everyone should pull their weight everyone should come to the table uh, sustainability is not optional it's a must do so 
everyone should pull their weight and bring their effort into the table. Great. Great. And, uh, and finally, I think, well, we call, well, we understand that the, you know, different levels of, um, you know, goodwill and, uh, and ability across, uh, you know, the region, for example, I think there is need to consolidate and integrate on the approaches that uh, are being implemented towards, uh, you know, sustainability and ensuring that uh, we are more resilient to climate change. So it's no longer Kenyan issue, a Ugandan issue. Uh, you know, everybody and every government needs to come under probably some level of coordination of non-duplication of, uh, of policies and, uh, and frameworks that in one way, you know, would be supporting for the short term and in the long term, businesses and stakeholders do not get as much support that they need to be able to actualize resilience. Yeah, I completely agree. Eva, I can see you've, you've, you've joined. I think we've probably run out of time, haven't we? Yes, yes, we have. But the discussion has been uh, fantastic and most insightful. And I think we've ended on a, on a very good note. As Mumbi says, um, it's a must do. Sustainability is a must do. We have no choice. Um, and, and if you're not thinking about this seriously and prioritizing it, um, you will be left behind. Um, and and uh, absolutely agree with, with Emily. It's about partnerships. Um, we can't sit on opposite sides of the table. Um, and as Amcham, we, we, we really believe and, and promote uh, partnerships for good. And this is part of the initiative um, that we have uh, under the Force for Good initiative. So I just want to say thank you for the panelists today. Thank you to our members um, for, for sharing your, your initiatives. Thank you for Victor for, for being our guest speaker today. And, and we look forward to other engagements. And uh, thank you so much, um, Rebecca and your, your team at Hudson and Sandler for your continued support uh, and partnership uh, with us on the AmCham Force for Good uh, initiative. Uh, just quickly on next steps, uh, we, we uh, are planning a number of activities this year uh, under this initiative. Uh, and one of them is just to benchmark uh, where our members are today regarding prioritization of sustainability and social impact. Um, and so we're doing a study. Um, and so my colleague Mercy will, will drop in the chat uh, a very short survey. It will take you less than five minutes to complete it. Please do. Um, this will help us uh, gauge where we are as members um, and see what we need to do in terms of building capacity and forming partnerships uh, towards um, greater social economic outcomes for Kenya. Um, this is the first of four round tables. The next one is on the 30th of September, where we'll be covering uh, health and well-being. So please do uh, keep that note. And, and when we send the invitation, uh, join us again. And, and we, we look forward to an engaging uh, discussion like the one we had today uh, on issues that, um, that touch on health. So with that, thank you for everyone that joined us. Uh, it's, it's been great. And thank you for your comments in the chat. Thank you.